Yeah. 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 Good, huh? I'm looking for a mic plug. We can plug it oh, in. Oh, you need to do that? Okay. <laughs> right here. Is it plugged into the yeah, board? I got guys. I got a main. Rogers Park. We're up here on the stage at the Heartland Cafe. And, um, okay, here we go. One more time. Welcome to another edition of the Live from the Heartland Show. We're here on a very, very lovely and sunny day on the corner of Glenwood and Lunt. We are in the heart of Rogers Park, and once again, we are up here on the stage at the Heartland Cafe, where every Saturday morning we bring you another edition of the Live from the Heartland Show. I'm Michael James. I'm here with my co-host. Katie Hogan. And uh, we're going to have a good show. We're kind of excited. we got a lot of people. Uh, we do. We have a lot of people. We have a bunch of equipment. we got music <laughs> happening. We've got... Um, uh, literary uh, neighbors, accomplished literary neighbors who also happen to change the world as a young 20-something, as a member of the Freedom Riders. Um, and a lot of our, our listeners saw that recent video that they showed. We've also got this band called Good Evening. What do you know about Good Evening, Michael? Well, I know that they, um, they're friends of our, our producer, Daniel, and uh, that they have gotten a lot of good publicity and that they uh, do some nice music specializing in midnight broken glass love songs. I love that. And uh, it's good. And they draw on a diverse base of musical influence. They're rich, stinging arrangements, string arrangements, sorry, and lush okay. harmonies. Okay, so do for, not let Michael so read on the air. At the yeah. As an old guy. Yeah. No Anyhow, reading on the air. They're going to be great. They're here, they got violins, they got all kind of all instruments. All right, all right. They're drinking their coffee, and we also are going to have <laughs> some people who are involved with Occupy Chicago. <laughs> yeah, Let's I'll have a talk. a big round of applause for everybody just as we get started. <laughs> all right. Right now, I'd like to welcome to the stage Candida Pugh. Candida, welcome to Live from the Heartland. I know you're an Evanstonian now, right? Yes, thank you. Oh, you get to come way closer to that, baby. Oh, right. <laughs> um, so you, uh, but you grew up in San Francisco. I grew up mostly in San Francisco, partly in Massachusetts. Okay, and don't be shy. I, I, I know you're. I'm not shy. I'm just. just I can far tell away. you exactly. <laughs> um, where were you? And what were you doing when you decided to get on a bus and join the Freedom Riders? Okay, well, um, it's not quite as romantic, but I actually didn't get on a bus. I got we'll be the judge of it. I got, a, I, I got on a plane, went to New Orleans, and then got on a train into Jackson. Yeah, but where were you when you decided to make that journey? I was, uh, I was living in uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and um, I was living with a friend from junior high school and her mother, and they had planned to go to this rally, and at the rally they were going to volunteer to go on the Freedom Rides. I really had my head in a different place and I you know they said do you want to go and I said well yeah sure why not <laughs> but I I didn't intend to volunteer I had no intention of volunteering so there were actually four of us and three were going to volunteer and I was along for the ride and it wound up just the reverse did it not as in my book I heard the speeches and I got swept away so I stood up and went to the front and there I was but the other three never got up. Well, I tell you, it's, um, you know, it was an exciting period. For me, I remember uh, early on uh, during the Montgomery bus boycott, it's, it's really the first wave of social consciousness. Um, and my dad, uh, always playing the devil advocate, even when I was a mere uh, 14 years old, 15, around in that age. But 
the civil rights movement really captured my heart, my imagination, my brain. Uh, and you, you, in your book, you do talk about uh, listening to a, a preacher really talk. Well, it's, uh, actually, there were a couple of people talking, but there was a fellow who had, was active in North Carolina and talked about uh, the, the struggles and the way people were treated. And uh, that was the kind of thing we were hearing from people. We were uh, seeing some of it on the news early on. Uh, can you, can you recreate that a little bit, how you were uh, captivated by the words of this activist from North Carolina? Well, he, uh, he like everyone in my book, except uh, Jerry, who's probably based on me, um, was made up. And his speech was made up because uh, it was 50 years ago, and I don't remember what anybody said. <laughs> but uh, what I do remember is, uh, and, and this happens in the book as well, I remember uh, the murder of Emmett Till. I was 12 years old. He was 14. Um, he made he made international news. His mother, a very incredibly courageous and strong woman, insisted that his casket be left open uh, so that the world could see what had happened to that child. Um, his murderers bragged about what they did to a child after they were acquitted in the face of overwhelming evidence of their guilt. Anyway, I read, as Jerry does in the book, every syllable about that in the local press. And I looked at the horrific pictures, and I knew that something was awful in this country. Something was terribly wrong and had to be fixed. So I think when I went to that rally, even though Emma Till wasn't on my mind at that moment, because it was five years later, it was five years later, Six years later, um, I uh, I think that it tapped right into my feelings about that murder, and uh, I wanted I wanted to take a position. I wanted to stand up against that. Candida, give us uh, and the listeners a little background, a little more background on Emmett Till and what happened to him. I mean, he was from Chicago, and I believe we had his cousin or his uncle on yeah, a show. Yeah, we interviewed once. Um, and, his. Uh, it's a, it, you know, it's a hell of a story, and it's a moving story. And uh, just fill in a little of the the pieces about what actually happened to Emmett Till. Well, Emmett was, uh, as you say, was from Chicago, and his cousin uh, was going back to Money, Mississippi, where the family, um, uh, the, the, a big part of the family lived. And Emmett wanted, he begged to go along. His mother was quite worried uh, because she knew Mississippi and she knew her son. And her son was, um, he had some learning disabilities, he had a lisp, he, but he was tough and he was full of himself and uh, uh, he, you know, when his cousins told him in Money, Mississippi that here's the way you act as a black person in the South, uh, he blew them off and he said, you know, that he wasn't going to uh, kowtow to racists. So they went into the uh, local store and um, Emmett, uh, the, the storekeeper's wife was there, white woman, and Emmett supposedly whistled at her. Some people say he did even more, sort of, uh, not physically, but uh, spoke to her in a way that was considered uh, utterly disrespectful. I uh, said she was cute or asked her for a date or something. Anyway, he was showing off, and uh, his cousins were uh, terrified, but Emmett didn't realize the trouble he was in. It took three or four nights, I think, before um, a group of men showed up at his uncle's house in the middle of the night, and ripped Emmett out of his bed, and threw him into the back of a truck, and carted him off, tortured him for several hours. They made him carry a... Um, a fan, I think it weighed 100 pounds, something. I was just, he was very strong. They made him carry it to the edge of the river. It was a cotton gin, cotton gin fan. And then they took a chain and put it around his neck, shot him, and pushed him into the river. When the authorities searched for the body of Emma Till, they found many bodies. Hmm. 
hmm. bodies of people who had long disappeared and never been looked for. And the irony of that is that in 1964, when Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney were lynched for uh, working on voting rights in Mississippi, uh, I heard uh, Cheney's brother speak about that, and he, he said quite ironically that Cheney was lucky to have been lynched in the company of two white men because otherwise no one would have ever heard his name because at the same time there were many bodies discovered when they looked for, hit for those bodies. So um, that kind of stuff went on rampantly. Candida, uh, will you give everybody uh, a little bit of the story about what happened to you and then we'll, we'll talk some about your book and how they intermix. Okay, well, I, uh, I got to New Orleans and... Um, what year was it? This was 1961. I was there in July. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met up with a group of uh, young black women from CORE who were incredible. CORE is Congress of Racial Equality, which is one of the main civil rights groups of the time. That's right. They were the organizers, the original organizers of the Freedom Rides. Anyway, these, uh, these young women were very poor. They didn't have the money to, uh, to take a bus downtown. They didn't have the money to buy anything to eat during the daytime. And yet, for a year, they single-handedly picketed and sat in in downtown New Orleans and finally cracked it. And one of the most wonderful aspects of that story was that when they originally started sitting in at Woolworths, um, if you can imagine, Woolworths would not serve black people. Um, anyway, when they first started sitting in at Woolworths, the uh, waitresses would throw coffee on them, water, glasses, sugar, uh, and taunt them. But after they had been sitting in, of course the movement was nonviolent, after they had been sitting in for several months, if they missed a day, the waitresses would say, well, where were you, honey? Uh, we missed you yesterday. And by the time that Woolworths integrated, those waitresses were perfectly happy to serve anybody who came to the counter. So that was a, that was a beautiful story. So I sat in with them, um, and the next morning got on a train, traveled to, um, uh, well, I traveled to Jackson in the company of, I believe it was six other Freedom Riders. Ironically, uh, all of us were white, which was kind of funny. Um, it was a very unusual group, um, because I believe the majority of the Freedom Riders, uh, I think they were mostly d divided equally, but, uh, but our group happened to be all white. Yeah, when we got off the train and started down the steps to the depot, all around us I heard murmurs, freedom riders, freedom riders. And all I could think was, how do they know? <laughs> but of course, seven young people. You've heard of Gaydar, group. right? Yeah. This was prior to that. Yeah. Yeah. They could tell you weren't really white. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. So it was all set up, because in Alabama, <clears throat> of course, the, um, the Klan had attacked two buses, uh, of the first two buses of Freedom Riders, they set fire to one and beat within an inch of their lives uh, the occupants of the second bus. Um, but Mississippi was smarter, Mississippi decided to make it very routine so the press would not be interested. The Kennedys were not interested, um, except to tell us that we should go home. So we were, um, <clears throat> I was interrogated by the FBI, uh, simply because I refused to say whether I was uh, black or white. What I said was, nobody knows for sure. <laughs> the, uh, the, After all, it's America. That's true. <laughs> it is America. The mother of my, um, the mother of my junior high school friend told me later that the FBI came to her house out in Sausalito. Still trying to track down that racial identity thing. Yeah, they wanted thing. to know. They asked her if she had ever had a colored maid named Candy. Oh. <laughs> so uh, she thought that was pretty funny. Oh, God. Anyway, so then, um, then we were transferred, we were given this farce of a trial, and we were transferred to Parchman Penitentiary, 
Uh, That's the, a badge of honor to have spent time under that roof at yeah, that time. Yeah, they put us in maximum security supposedly for our, our own safety. I think it was so we wouldn't contaminate any of their prisoners. <laughs> we were the first women ever to be incarcerated at Parchman. Um, wow. But they had no room for us anywhere else, so that was the idea to, to break their bank. So were the Freedom Riders all in the same place together then, away from the other, yes, the they, rest of the population? We were, we were on separate wings, male and female, but uh, we were together, right? You know, one of the things in the book, uh, uh, when you're in New Orleans and you're uh, getting off the train, uh, you describe an older black gentleman with gnarly hands. He's a, he's a, a porter or a red cap or something, and, and he kind of, uh, he wouldn't smile at you, or you, Terry, the featured person in the book, which is the you. The character. And um, uh, he, uh, he didn't smile, but he leaned down or kneeled down, and he went to tie his shoes with his gnarled hands, and he flashed you a V sign. Yes, yes, that... Uh I, I got tears in my eyes because it was, uh, it was so clear that even to smile was dangerous for this man, and yet he, he so desperately wanted to convey to us that, uh, that he appreciated what we were doing. And when I went back to Jackson in May for the 50th reunion of the Freedom Riders, uh, we were given, by the way, we were given a uh, royal welcome. <laughs> Uh, the city fathers really. Times they are changing. <laughs> and not totally, not totally. No, I'm only, they're when, still like they were. <laughs> we, we had seven buses and uh, we went to Parchman. And by the way, I stood in the cell that I thought I was in, and I don't know how I stood it. Uh, six foot by nine, and I got claustrophobic even with the, with the uh, bars open. But. Oh, Parchman, by the way, has put up a plaque honoring the Freedom Riders. If you want to talk about something funny, um, you can go there and, and see. I think Nelson Mandela started that tall, that, yeah. that, that little thing. Uh, uh, a plaque at the prison. A plaque at the prison yeah, thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Be honored by your prisoner thing. Yeah, right. We're proud to say that we uh, that we tormented the free, the Freedom Riders. Anyway, when we were leaving Parchman, we were driving through the Delta. Seven buses. It was uh, twilight, so uh, many of us turned on the lights above us to uh, to read because it's it's a long trip. And all of a sudden, all seven buses went black. And I was pretty sure that the reason for that was we were in the Delta. And with those lights shining on us, uh, we, were, targets. we were targets. Yeah, we would have been targets. And they wanted to make sure we got out of Mississippi alive. You are listening to the Live from the Heartland show on WLUW 88.7 Chicago Sound Alliance. I'm Michael James. I'm here with Katie Hogan, and we're talking to Candida Pugh, who has a new book out based on her experiences as a freedom writer uh, in getting busted in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. The book is Bridge of the Single Hair. Uh, Candida, one of the other things I just wanted to get a little, uh, to give a flavor of the times, uh, as you're leaving the New Orleans airport uh, and the group of you who are mostly white are picked up by uh, uh, a, black, a black man in an old Volkswagen, or maybe it wasn't that old Volkswagen van, and as you're leaving the parking lot, uh, the parking lot attendant is interrogating the guy because he has white people in the car. Is that something uh, that happened too? Uh, no, that actually didn't happen, but I, I thought it'd be pretty neat because it could have. <laughs> what, what did happen uh, leaving the New Orleans airport, and I, I don't think if you, if you haven't seen this, I don't think you can appreciate how it kicks you in the gut. You hear about these signs, white, colored, uh, but when you see them for the first time, it's, it's quite different from knowing that they exist. Um, the first ones I saw, we passed a gas station. There was uh, three signs, one over a standard gas station restroom door, white gentleman, one over another standard restroom door, white ladies, and then over in the back, an outhouse that was practically falling over that said simply colored. 
Um, we didn't have unisex bathrooms in those days. Uh, so not only was it the shock of the racial uh, implications of those signs, but the shock that because you weren't white, you could be subjected to something that was generally considered um, inappropriate, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I, I just remember that as a real kick in the gut. Can, Candida, uh, we've talked a lot about your activism, which spawned the memories that made this book. Um, tell us just a little bit, because we're lined up with some great guests behind you, which are not all that unrelated. Uh, I, I know you occupy Chicagoers were listening just then, right? Yeah. Um, how much other writing did you do before this? Is this your first thing out of the hopper that you, did it come full blown? This was the first book, uh, first novel I wrote. Yes, I have written several others, but uh, this is the first one I wrote, this first one to get published. I wrote it when I was 35. Uh, an agent represented it, tried to, tried to sell it to New York. Uh, it went around for two years, and it got two responses. One was quite a bit of praise, mm -hmm. and the other one was uh, brace yourself. Nobody wants to read about Negroes. <laughs> and wait, so I couldn't which, which publishing house was that? <laughs> several, okay. several. And in fact, um, the help, about which I don't want to say much, but uh, the help itself was rejected, I understand, 60 times, and I suspect for the same stupid reason. Um, can you tell us a little bit, or just tell us how you got the title of the book? Uh, it comes from a fairy tale, I believe. Yes, it was my favorite uh, fairy tale when I was a little girl. Um, and I, I loved the line, and he ran, and she ran, and he ran, and she ran, and they both ran until they came to the bridge of the single hair. Um, this is about a little girl who goes to rescue her three sisters from an evil giant. And the only reason she can get away is because the giant cannot escape across the bridge of the single hair. 